Pioneer 10 and 11 made the first passage through the asteroid belt, leading the way for the venerable Voyager missions. These two probes made a grand tour of the outer solar system before slipping away into interstellar space. Jupiter, the first and greatest of the outer planets with its broiling sky, has had fleeting visits from other missions like Ulysses, Galileo and Cassini, each adding to the mosaic of Jupiter and its violent atmosphere. My name is Amy Simon Miller and I study the atmospheres of the Jovian planets. Weather on Jupiter is confined to a rather thin layer kind of high up in the atmosphere. So the tops of the clouds are what we're seeing when we look at Jupiter. One thing we're seeing in the southern part of the equatorial region is little V-shaped clouds or chevrons, and we wanted to understand how those are moving in the atmosphere. What we think chevrons are are simply holes in the clouds. There are simply areas where we don't see any bright white clouds. The Cassini mission flew by Jupiter in the year 2000, and because it was a slow, distant flyby, we got a lot of coverage of the planet over a long time period. So we were able to put those images together and make movies. Using these movies, we observed Rossby waves that caused north-south meanders in a jet stream south of the equator. With new movies, we instead focused on hotspots. Hotspots are unique because we believe that there is a Rossby wave similar to what we previously detected, but instead of this Rossby wave moving north-south, it primarily moves up and down in the atmosphere. The downward portion of the wave pushes air down into warmer layers of the atmosphere. This causes any clouds that are embedded within the wave to evaporate and prevents further clouds from forming. So at any given time, there are approximately eight to 10 hotspots in Jupiter's atmosphere that are spaced roughly evenly apart from one another. We believe that each of the downward portions of this Rossby wave corresponds to the hotspots that we see on Jupiter. This new finding is exciting because it'll allow us to re-examine the Galileo probe data and allow us to better understand it and better place it in the context of Jupiter's overall global climate and atmosphere. The latest probe to be specifically aimed for Jupiter is Juno. Launched 2011, the probe will reach Jupiter after a five-year journey. Juno's goal is to investigate Jupiter's interior structure and magnetosphere and help improve our understanding of the formation of the planet and therefore the history of our solar system. Juno spins like a propeller uh, where the propeller is kind of facing the sun because they're all solar powered. If you spin something, it stays spinning. It's like a gyroscope. We can use a spinning spacecraft to let each instrument get its turn to see Jupiter. We get to go very close to the planet, inside the radiation belts instead of outside the radiation belt. We're in a polar orbit, so by small adjustments of the timing, we can map the entire planet. We can get repeated stripes at different longitudes as Jupiter spins underneath us. It does mean that Juno is going to see the polar regions to a greater extent than with other spacecraft, but I think the most important thing is that it gets in very close to the planet as part of that ellipse, brings it in a few thousand miles above those cloud tops, very close, near the equator. We're gonna go over the poles of Jupiter. That means we can study the magnetosphere in a different way. A magnetosphere is the sphere of influence of a magnetic field. So a planet that has a magnetic field has a magnetosphere when its sphere of influence extends beyond the planet out into space and affects the region around it. The magnetosphere of Jupiter is vast. So if you think of Jupiter being 10 times the size of the Earth and the magnetosphere is 100 times the size of Jupiter. The Juno probe is the furthest NASA has sent a solar-powered spacecraft. Sunlight provides 25 times less energy than on Earth, 
which means it requires advanced solar power technology with solar cells which are both 50% more efficient and more radiation tolerant than silicon cells. The craft also houses an electronics vault which is radiation shielded to protect the electronics aboard from the intense and deadly radiation environment around Jupiter. The probe carries a full set of sensors, a microwave radiometer for atmospheric sounding and composition study, plasma and energetic particle detectors, a vector magnetometer, a radio plasma wave experiment and ultraviolet, and an infrared imager, plus a color camera called JunoCam. In Roman mythology, which of course is rooted from Greek mythology, Juno was the uh, wife and sister uh, goddess of Jupiter. And Jupiter was sort of being naughty with some friends, so he cast a veil of clouds around himself and his friends. But of course, Juno was a fairly powerful god herself and used her powers to look right through the clouds and see the true nature of Jupiter and understand what he was really up to. And that's exactly what the Juno spacecraft does for us, is that it goes there with special instruments in a special orbit and uses its powers to see right through Jupiter's clouds and understand its true nature, which is holding these secrets for us about how the solar system formed and where we all came from. I would expect Juno to tell us more about how planets work, meaning how the heat gets out, what kinds of flows exist inside the body, how magnetic fields get generated, learning what Jupiter is made of, we will learn such a wide range of things. For indeed, Jupiter is the most massive planet in the solar system. It is the body you want to understand in order to understand the architecture of everything else, including Earth. Juno's year-long mission will end with a deorbit burn and a slow descent into the upper atmosphere where it will continue to send back scientific data until its destruction. Perhaps the jewel of the solar system is Saturn with her spectacular rings. All four of the outer planets have rings of ice and rock but Saturn's is the most complicated and, with thousands of ringlets, the most visible. There are several groups of rings classified A through to G. Some are formed by shepherd moons within the rings and by gravitational tidal effects from others outside. Yet some gaps are still unexplained.